Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're most welcome to this inaugural event of the IIEA's new Global Europe project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this project aims to address, analyze, and communicate to a wider public the debate on the EU's role in the world and Ireland's role in the multilateral order, with a particular focus on Ireland's term as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which begins in January 2021 and ends in December 2022. And we're delighted to be joined today by Federica Mogherini, Director of the College of Europe and former High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak to us. Rector Mogherini, uh, who will address uh, Europe's global role and the future of the multilateral system in a post-pandemic world, will speak for roughly 10 minutes or so, and then we will go to a question and answer uh, with our audience. Um, you will be able to join the Q&A using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them and have a good discussion uh, once Rector Mogherini has finished her presentation. Uh, just a reminder that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. And please submit your question and answers via the um, Q&A function on Zoom. Um, uh, we would be grateful if you could identify yourselves and your affiliation uh, in your question. And um, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So I would just like now to formally introduce uh, Rector Mogherini prior to handing over to her. Uh, Federica Mogherini has been the Rector of the College of Europe uh, since September 2020. And prior to this, of course, she served as High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, and also as Vice President of the European Commission from 2014 to 2019. And prior to joining the EU, um, she was Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, uh, and a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, where she headed many delegations in that capacity. Uh, she is Federica Mogherini, is a fellow of the Harvard Kennedy School, and she is also a member of the trustee board of trustees of the International Crisis Group. And she has co-chaired the United Nations High Level Panel on Internal Displacement since January 2020. Uh, in terms of her involvement in disarmament uh, and nuclear test ban, I think it's very interesting that uh, she's a member of the group of eminent persons of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization and a member of the European Leadership Network for Multilateral Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation and also a member of the Board of Directors of the Italian Institute for Foreign Affairs, a sister institute of ours. Uh, so, Rector Mogherini, you're most welcome, and uh, we look forward to your address and discussion, and the floor virtual, I'm afraid, but the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, for this opportunity to share uh, some uh, uh, thoughts uh, about uh, the role of the European Union in the world. And if you allow me, uh, and as it is indicated also in, uh, in the um, short title of my introduction, uh, the role uh, of the European Union in the multilateral system after or during the uh, pandemic times, with a special reference also uh, to the role of Ireland uh, in, in this framework, uh, especially in the moment when Ireland uh, is getting ready to get uh, its uh, seat in the uh, Security Council of the United Nations. So I'll try to be uh, brief because I think uh, interaction uh, with the audience is going to be uh, interesting, not only for the audience itself, but also for me. Um, I'll try to be brief and touch upon um, a few elements of uh, the current landscape. First of all, the role of the European Union uh, in the world. Um, I have to say that out of my direct experience, um, we Europeans sometimes tend to uh, underestimate the power and the role uh, and the impact of our actions uh, in the world. Uh, my um, mo most often, um, uh, I've heard uh, this uh, expression from my interlocutors. I have to say, 
uh, far away uh, countries as much as uh, our own neighborhoods, both in, uh, in the south and in the east of Europe. So many interlocutors, uh, different uh, backgrounds have told me, um, you don't realize the power you have, you don't realize how important is the European Union in the world. So this would be maybe my first point. Sometimes um, others uh, see our uh, global role and our impact in the world much more than Europeans themselves uh, do. Um, especially in these times of uncertainties and um, uh, a more conflictual uh, and, and uh, contested uh, world order, uh, where indeed uh, the transactional approach uh, to international relations seem to prevail. Uh, the European Union has been and continues to be, I think, a sort of uh, um, shield, uh, a place where other like-minded partners can find uh, protection is a strong word, but I think it is exactly what others felt. Uh, the shoulders of the European Union are big enough, both economically and diplomatically and politically, uh, to uh, offer others uh, that might have the same approach to multilateralism and peace building and conflict prevention and diplomacy to um, face um, a world that is definitely uh, going in another direction. Um, I think that the power of the European Union in this respect is for sure economic. Uh, I think that uh, relations that European Union uh, has built uh, across the world in terms of trade agreements that always imply um, respect for human rights, environmental standards, sustainable developments, uh, climate change action, and so on and so forth, offer an inspiration also to others uh, to support uh, uh, free and fair trade globally. Uh, I think that's the power that the European Union has uh, diplomatically uh, with um, a presence in uh, uh, literally uh, all countries in the world uh, is unparalleled and the network uh, of uh, um, delegations of the European Union in the world, coupled with the presence of member states, being that 28 during my mandate, 27 today, uh, is and offers a unique um, mix of uh, instruments that can be used in the uh, relationship and in the work with the uh, third countries. Uh, and I think that in the purely diplomatic uh, work the European Union does, being it uh, in facilitating um, negotiations in peace processes, processes in the support uh, to mediation, I think of all the support the European Union gives to women in peace processes, for instance, and mediation, uh, or the support to the UN system as such, I think there's no other global actor like the European Union as as powerful and at the same time as humble as the European Union. Um, maybe we should uh, maybe we should be even a little bit more um, self-confident. Uh, this is uh, this is something that I think uh, could be helpful in uh, uh, in these times. I think that the pandemic has offered, uh, well, first of all, has hit the Europeans um, probably more than others, our economies, our uh, uh, social fabric, uh, our way of living for sure, um, the lives of so many Europeans uh, in so many European countries, but has also offered uh, the European Union, I think, a unique opportunity to showcase the cooperative model uh, of the international stage. Um, I think that most of us uh, in late February, beginning of March, when the pandemic started, uh, to, to hit on the global level uh, more dramatically and more systematically, we all thought that this would have been maybe a game changer on the world scene, uh, trying to, uh, to shift from the um, bilateral or unilateral transactional approach on to, to international uh, relations and foreign policy towards a more cooperative multilateral uh, approach, which is normally the European Union way the cooperative multilateral approach. My impression is that in these months, we've actually seen more of the same uh, with uh, unilateral um, temptations uh, being even um, more rooted in those that were thinking that that was the right way to go uh, and the need for multilateralism to, to be even more, um, even stronger and, and more rooted in those that were always advocating for this. So I'm afraid that the post pandemic world hoping 
will get there at a certain point. Um, the pandemic world and the post-pandemic world would not in themselves represent uh, a big a paradigm shift uh, in terms of international relations and foreign policy practices, um, unless um, it has a, a strong impact on uh, the election of the new President of the United States, today is too early to say, probably next week we'll have different elements on that. But apart from that, I don't think that the pandemic itself will represent a, a paradigm shift uh, in the uh, foreign policy um, uh, framework globally, but it does represent uh, an opportunity for the European Union to act as a global player because it gives us the possibility, I still say us because I think we are still in this altogether, um, gives us the possibility, first of all, to um, act as a, a convening power. Think of the role that the European Union is playing in, for instance, um, coordinating work on uh, uh, health uh, support uh, across the European Union and outside of it, the humanitarian support, but also the work uh, on medical research and vaccine. Uh, and to show the added value of the cooperation elements in international relations. I think this is the trademark of the European Union. Uh, the model that we can uh, I mean, not export because it's not our way, uh, but uh, offer as an inspiration to the rest of the world. The more cooperative you get, the more successful you are. And in real terms, even if sometimes in Europe we don't realize how much we have achieved in this uh, uh, decades of union, um, we are still the best place uh, to be in the world in terms of economy, in terms of rights, uh, social uh, working rights, uh, gender equality, far from perfect, uh, but for sure uh, it's uh, uh, compared to other places in the world is definitely the best place to be. So now coming to the role of the European Union, what I have seen directly uh, in my five years uh, in, uh, uh, in office as the high representative is for instance, the key uh, support that the European Union is able to give and is giving to the UN system. And here, uh, I would like to um, spend my last couple of minutes of introduction uh, to highlight how important it is uh, to have, uh, first of all, to have member states sitting in the Security Council. Uh, and this is why I'm so glad to see Ireland um, taking this responsibility as of January. In particular, Ireland, uh, being uh, Ireland, a country and a member state that has uh, always had um, and a very strong, um, uh, dedicated multilateral um, approach uh, focused on peace, mediation, um, uh, non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, uh, I think that the credentials of Ireland uh, in the UN system and the international scene are, are really impressive and it's an asset for the European Union. Many identify the UN system as a, um, a complicated uh, place for the European Union to play its role because of the plurality of member states. And uh, when you say, even mention the expression member states in the UN system, it's not the member states of the European Union, it's member states of the UN. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, I have to say that I have seen myself and I have, I think, contributed hopefully a little bit to increase that. Member states coordinate within the UN system within the Security Council work. And this has an impact on the way in which the UN system works or not. Mm -hmm. I will give you just two examples. They're far away, well, two or three, but we can have many others. Mm -hmm. Think of the role of the European Union in uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, negotiations without the European Union and the coordinated work with member states and with third parties. Mm -hmm. Probably the Sustainable Development Goals would have never been achieved in the UN framework. The same can be uh, uh, considered for the climate uh, change, the Paris Agreement on climate change without the European Union and member states and the coordinating role of the European Union, that agreement also would have never been achieved and its implementation would have been even worse than it is now. And if you think of some of the key peace processes that the European, the, the UN is, is trying to, uh, to, to uh, support or to the conflicts it's trying to solve without the European Union uh, support and contribution, the UN system would have probably um, not uh, managed to uh, at least maintain a certain uh, common ground uh, on the international level, uh, on the parameters on which the conflicts uh, need to be solved. I think, for instance, 
um, uh, to the uh, Middle East peace process or how I think it should be rather referred to the lack of Middle East peace process, uh, an issue that I know is very um, close to the Irish uh, um, heart. Uh, well, uh, in difficult times, um, the UN uh, could count uh, always on the European Union uh, and I have to say on the Arab League, first of all, to coordinate but also to um, stick to uh, the parameters that were agreed uh, previously, even if and when they were challenged the most. So I would say that uh, the European Union has been and continues to be a sort of life-saving instrument for multilateralism uh, in these difficult times. Um, I think of the peace process negotiations in Afghanistan, the support to the role of women. Uh, I think of the peace process in Myanmar. I think of so many dynamics where uh, Syria, Libya, uh, Ukraine, so many dynamics in which without the European Union, the situation would be much worse than it is today. Having said that, I perfectly see the challenges. Uh, one for uh, all uh, the fact that we moved from 28 to 27, uh, the, the, the complicated relations across the Atlantic uh, that in one, in any case, uh, however, uh, the results of the US elections will be, uh, will need to be, uh, I think, uh, re-looked at. Um, still, I think that uh, the European Union power and impact on the world stage uh, is much more relevant than uh, perceived by Europeans. Uh, and this would be my, my main message. We have a potential as a union um, that sometimes we don't fully use. We have a potential that we underestimate. We have a responsibility uh, towards multilateralism, for instance, uh, that sometimes we, um, we, we underestimate. Um, it's far from perfect. We have many shortcomings, uh, but I have not seen a better diplomatic uh, network and system. I have not seen in the world a more functional um, global actor, uh, even with all our limits. Um, and I think that this power of projecting a cooperative um, model uh, is also a source of inspiration for other regions. I think of, for instance, ASEAN, uh, Southeast Asia, I think of some areas of Latin America or Africa that look at the European Union as uh, not only a partner, a reliable partner, but also as um, somehow uh, an inspiration for developing their own regional cooperative order beyond the logic of uh, conflict and confrontation that is uh, uh, so much uh, uh, popular these times. Um, I think I'll finish here uh, because I, I'm sure that uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience will guide us in one direction or another. So many different aspects can be covered. Uh, and I am sure that uh, uh, some of the issues I have not mentioned will come up uh, in the Q&A uh, session. So again, I'll, uh, I'll stop here and uh, I'm ready to uh, answer questions, uh, enter into conversations with uh, um, any of uh, uh, the participants to the event. And thank you very much again for this very good initiative. Thank you very much indeed, Raptor. And thank you for that introduction because uh, I think you have uh, indicated very clearly the advantages of the European Union uh, in the very broadest sense. And I think this is very timely because uh, coming at us from a number of different directions, we have people urging uh, the European Union to become a greater foreign policy player. You have uh, charges that the European Union is only acting as a referee, handing out red and yellow cards to felons and uh, not playing any particular role. Uh, the the uh, different types of role and the different types of instruments uh, and the values that the European Union are um, um, promoting tend to be uh, often neglected in the uh, demand for uh, a greater and a stronger uh, role for the Union. So I think it's very timely that you um, uh, have reminded us of, of the values and, uh, and the actions and what the Union stands for, uh, which is, as I say, very often um, neglected. We do indeed have a number of questions uh, which will, will guide the direction. Uh, uh, so the first question I have is from um, Paul Edouard, who is formerly of our Department of Finance. 
and he asked, uh, can the EU survive as a global power or at all at its present stage of integration? Do we need or could we expect uh, any further integration, particularly in the post-Brexit um, scenario? Uh, do you feel we need closer integration politically? Well, um, first of all, I have to say that I, um, I witnessed, uh, I, um, I think I contributed also to uh, go one step further on the current integration uh, that we have uh, at 27, but actually we had it, we established it at 28 still, when we uh, implemented for the first time ever one of the provisions of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the permanent structure cooperation in the security and defense field, for instance. Um, that step of, uh, um, of uh, having uh, somehow two speeds uh, was always uh, present in the treaties, but never uh, put in place. And uh, uh, it was just uh, uh, a few months after uh, the results of the Brexit referendum that we went in the direction of uh, implementing that provision of uh, introducing a permanent structure cooperation on security and defense in the European Union. Now, many uh, have connected the two um, uh, as uh, uh, one being the consequence of the other. Uh, it was not the case. Uh, and I have to say what I experienced at that time uh, was a very constructive UK contribution uh, to the deepening of the European integration on the security and defense cooperation. Probably because um, once uh, the UK felt uh, out or one step out, uh, they were not opposing any more uh, further steps of integration because they were not touching themselves anymore. That is my personal interpretation of this. But if you think of it, we adopted all decisions on permanent structure cooperation and all the uh, steps we've taken on an increased integration on security and defense policy in the European Union with the positive uh, participation and vote of the UK still being a member of the European Union. Um, paradox, uh, not so much, because I think that the UK uh, has always had this clear in mind. And don't forget, uh, in, during my mandate, Boris Johnson was uh, for a certain period of time the foreign minister. Uh, so he was the one also guiding this. I have the impression that the UK has always had very clear in mind that it was in its own interest to have a strong European Union uh, as a player on foreign and security policy, because we share and we will continue, I think, to share the same values and the same viewpoint on, on the global geopolitics. Uh, think of the conflict in Ukraine, think of the peace processes. I don't think that the UK foreign policy position will diverge from the European Union one um, in relevant terms. What they are missing is the participation to um, the use of the instruments we have in common, uh, which is the loss for them more than, more than for us, probably. Uh, think of the sanctions, uh, think of the, yes, of the coordination in the UN system and things like that. Do we need, as the European Union, a further step on, on integration? I guess that this refers to the possibility of introducing qualified majority voting, for instance, on decision making. I have uh, a very... Um, I have a, a personal opinion about that as it differs very much from, uh, uh, from that of many friends and colleagues. Personally, I don't think that in foreign policy, uh, for instance, uh, having qualified majority voting um, would uh, be a good idea. Um, in my experience, but I might be wrong, in my experience, um, unanimity in the decision making has never been a problem. In five years, we never uh, missed uh, a decision um, because of lack of unanimity. The problem was more the lack of implementation of the decision that was taken altogether. So ministers agreeing on a position, then you know foreign policy is not a legislation uh, procedure. Is, you, you don't have a law. You have diplomatic actions, you have the marshes, you have uh, uh, positioning uh, and it requires the day after a position is taken, uh, it requires all the players to play uh, according to the, to, to the script that we had uh, uh, written together. And I don't think that you increase the level of uh, um, ownership uh, in the implementation phase of a foreign policy decision if you introduce a unanimity vote 
On the contrary, you might even uh, provide some justifications to those member states that are, let's say, less enthusiastically implementing decisions um, if they can say this was not really my decision. On top of that, if you introduce qualified majority voting on foreign policy, you offer a very powerful uh, argument to your counterparts, to, your, um, to the third parties that might accuse you of not being united and that would be on the record. So a high representative would not be anymore in a position of saying, no, the European Union is united on this. This is the common decision and common position because divisions would be, uh, would be recorded somehow, would be certified. And I think this would weaken the position of the European Union in, uh, in uh, its foreign policy uh, and its, uh, its global actions. Um, there can be, um, there can be uh, some uh, issues, some topics on which uh, um, more integration could be beneficial. Um, I, I give, or, or some changes on an institutional level could be beneficial. I give you an example. I always thought that uh, uh, the double hat that the high representative has, uh, that of uh, chairing the council on one side and uh, uh, being the vice president of the European Commission on the other side, is an incredible asset. Um, it was exactly because of these, uh, this complexity and, and the variety of instruments that we managed to, um, to uh, uh, realize so much on the security and defense sector, for instance. Without that provision of, uh, of the Lisbon Treaty, we would have not had the same uh, capacity to do so. So for instance, uh, having uh, double-hatted uh, roles beyond foreign and security policy could be I think a good idea. I think of the economic, uh, of all the economic sector of the European Union activities. I think that might make sense. But in terms of further integration, I don't think the problem is the number uh, of uh, uh, or the speed of the uh, of the groups uh, inside the European Union. I don't think that the problem is that uh, yeah, 28, 27, 22, or 15, or 29. I don't think that is a problem. I think the problem is a problem of ownership and energy that uh, our public opinions and our political leaderships put in, in uh, uh, bridging the gap between uh, the member states and the European Union as such. Ministers take decisions together and then when they go to the press room, it's the decision of the European Union. But the European Union doesn't exist without the member states, it's us. The only ones that cannot do this trick are the Belgians because they cannot say Brussels has decided because Brussels is them. <laughs> but all the others you might have noticed in many, in many cases, uh, if a decision is unpopular or difficult, it immediately becomes Brussels has decided. And bridging this gap, this distance between the national capitals and, uh, and the European Union um, as, as the common house, as us, uh, is I think the real the real integration further integration step that we uh, need, but it's a it's a step we take in our minds. is not a, is not a, a treaty change. Thank you very much indeed for that elaboration. You make a, a very powerful argument for uh, maintaining solidarity among all of the EU uh, member states. And indeed, I have a question uh, in relation to that from John O'Hagan of Trinity College Dublin. Uh, because he had asked, and I think you've answered it, can the EU ever have an effective and expedient foreign policy role as long as the national veto power remains in place? But he goes on to say that given this, is there any possibility of a group of EU member states like France, Germany, Italy and Spain, combined population 250 million, moving ahead to form a subgroup of like-minded member states in relation to foreign policy? as for example happened in monetary union. Would you allow that this, this may arise, there may be a possibility in the future? Uh, you know, um, I, I have two, um, two thoughts to share on this um, and they might surprise you. One is that uh, uh, this somehow already exists, um, not formally, but uh, uh, within the council, within the foreign affairs council, um, there are already uh, some formats, informal uh, formats of uh, groups of member states that come together uh, and act 
um, somehow on behalf of the European Union, together with the High Representative, uh, to bring forward some of the policies that are commonly decided. That was actually for the first time uh, formally introduced with the um, format of the negotiations on the Iran nuclear deal, where you had the E3 um, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, were um, uh, leading uh, uh, the way. Um, uh, but that was somehow a work that was uh, uh, led by the high representative with the active mobilization of uh, a limited number of member states, but always with a connection with the totality of the other member states that were constantly kept informed and were constantly able to back the work of these member states, this smaller group of member states. And in that case, uh, the legal basis for this was even a Security Council resolution that for the first time recognized the formal role of the uh, high representative of the European Union as a, as a negotiator, facilitator of the negotiations and the role of the E3 um, in, uh, uh, in this. Um, there are other formats where uh, individual member states or some member states, groups of member states come together uh, in interaction uh, or somehow uh, delegated by uh, the, secure, the, the, the Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, we established, for instance, uh, a few years ago, um, the um, uh, contact group uh, to facilitate, try to facilitate negotiations on Venezuela. Uh, in that case, you have a certain number of member states, if I don't remember wrong, some five or six member states that uh, uh, participated uh, uh, somehow on behalf of the other member states together with the high representative uh, to a format that included also non-European countries and obviously constantly reported back to the European Union uh, and the member states structures, being at uh, um, uh, the ambassadorial level, uh, the permanent representatives or uh, the ministerial level in the council. Uh, why this? Um, is this an attempt to, um, or this is risk, uh, does it this risk to diminish the role of the high representative or does it uh, question the, the, the Lisbon Treaty provisions? In my experience, and this is the second element I would add, we need not only the big member states, uh, but we need all member states when we do foreign policy, because it's not uh, so much a matter of uh, size of population, even if that counts. It's also, in many cases, a special, um, a special connection, a special background, a special interest, a special mobilization of public opinions that gives the added value to that particular member state in one file. Uh, not necessarily uh, you need to be one of the big ones uh, to have an impact on a, on a foreign policy file. Um, it might be because of um, uh, history, it might be because of geography, it might be because of the composition of your own um, population. Uh, if I stay on the Venezuela um, example, uh, Italy was part of the of the contact group um, because a large number of Italian citizens are also Venezuelan citizens. Mm -hmm. And so the access to large part of the population of Venezuelan population um, was facilitated by the Italian double nationality they had. Um, this is just an example. The Netherlands was part of it because we never think of it, but the Netherlands uh, is a, a geographical neighbor of Venezuela with the, uh, with the overseas territories. So um, was that, uh, is that always that the big ones have a bigger role to play? Not necessarily. You can have, for instance, the Baltic states playing a key role when it comes to, for instance, digital innovation in some countries in Africa. We had a wonderful experience with the Estonian presidency uh, promoting a digital innovation uh, with the African Union. Uh, so you need to use the different um, assets, the different uh, added values that come, uh, not to mention that comes without saying the role that Ireland, for instance, uh, plays when it comes again to the Middle East peace process. Is this uh, linked to size? Is it linked to, um, uh, to geography? Clearly not. It is linked to, um, to history and politics, I would say. So to me, the use of the specificities of all the 27 member states, big or small, um, is, uh, is a toolbox that we need to use in the European institutions. Um, and they complement each other. Uh, culturally, linguistically, you can have uh, uh, a, a, 
a, a language link, a cultural link uh, that makes it easier uh, for you to and open a door of negotiation. Thinking of the peace negotiations in Mozambique, uh, Portugal was always extremely helpful when it was a matter of facilitating the role of the European Union in that process. Uh, some other, in some other cases, is the other way around. You don't definitely don't want a post-colonial approach uh, to to your work, and then you move as far as way as possible of the former colony. Let's put it this way. So you need to mix and blend, uh, and you need all. This doesn't exclude, I think, the use uh, or the choice to create uh, smaller groups of countries, but not necessarily always the same ones, on specific issues that can support. Uh, the work of the high representative on something on some on some specific files. Thank you very much indeed for that. I know that you uh, placed um, heavy reliance on cultural contacts and cultural diplomacy, which I think uh, you felt played a significant role in uh, relations with uh, with other member states with outside the union. And uh, I think that that has been proven well to be the case. Um, I have a question. Uh, we have many questions. I hope we can get through most of them uh, from a uh, member of the Institute, Dara Moriarty. How do you see US foreign policy towards Europe shifting under a potential Biden administration? And likewise, how would four more years of Trump influence the future direction of EU foreign policy? Just a bit of a crystal ball here. I know the day that's in it is not a great one. You know, at, at least it doesn't ask uh, what I think, uh, uh, who I think the winner is. <laughs> that is a question I cannot really answer. Uh, but uh, I need to uh, there, I think. <laughs> just need to be a bit patient for a few, hopefully days, not more. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, um, it, it's not a mystery that um, the, the, the Trump administration has, uh, um, has introduced uh, um, I would say a difficult um, time in in the transatlantic relations, uh, not only with the European Union, but also I think the transatlantic alliance has faced some tensions from time to time. Um, I have I, I think that um, in any case, no matter I mean, the the if the next president will be one or the other, change everything. But I think that in uh, neither one case or another, we will simply go back to um, 10 years ago, five years ago. I think that in any case, uh, there will be the need to re-look at the transatlantic relations and the US European Union relations. And in one case, if Trump is reelected for another term, uh, I think that we will need to, on the two sides of the Atlantic, uh, at the administration's level, but also at other levels, uh, because we are both uh, complex um, bodies. We have uh, uh, societies, we have economic players, we have cities, and uh, in that case, we have states. And to sit together and define how to do damage control, if it's four more years, uh, of this and how to preserve the economic ties, the cultural ties, the, I would say even the family ties. I mean, you're Irish, I'm Italian. Uh, we know both very well that uh, uh, you take uh, uh, 100 Americans and uh, you for sure find so many Irish and Italian, uh, second, third, fourth generation. You take New York and you hardly manage to find a mayor, a governor, a chief of police or fire department that is not Italian <laughs> in, in its uh, uh, roots. So even family-wise, uh, it, it's a community we cannot divide. And I think that if Trump uh, has another term, um, we will need across the Atlantic to think how to preserve that unity despite the differences in policies that are evident. Support to multilateralism, climate change, uh, approach to uh, negotiations, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, yes, the cooperative versus transactional approach. Um, many many different things. Uh, if it's uh, uh, so, in one case, I think it's how to preserve what can be preserved uh, and without creating too much damage to the other connections we have: society, economy, and uh, and the files on which we still work together. Uh, which are many, um, not always very, very very visible, but are still many. Um, in the case of a Biden administration, I think that we will need to sit down and see, well, not, not me, but the Europeans and, and the Americans, the administrations, but also, I mean, 
I said not me, but also universities and, uh, and uh, uh, high uh, education institutions, because that is also part of the transatlantic community, um, society at large, sit and, how, uh, and, and understand together how to uh, review and refresh somehow, uh, revise uh, the paradigm of, of our relations. I don't think it will be back to before, because so many things have changed in the meantime, including maybe a little bit of trust on both sides. I think we lost a bit touch with the common vocabulary on the two sides of the of the Atlantic, and I think that will require a lot of work. Then there are practical files that will need to be looked at. Um, I think of the trade uh, negotiations. I think of the uh, of the files of the foreign policy files on which, for instance, uh, we might sit together and define, including on an academic level on which of these files a US-European Union cooperation is vital and needs to be reoperated somehow, revitalized, and on which of these files uh, we can do without. And so prioritizing and saying, for instance, on the Balkans, uh, we need to work together hand in hand because otherwise there's no way in which uh, the situation can, can get better. Um, on, on Syria or on Libya, there's no way in which we can solve or on the Middle East peace process, no way Afghanistan, no way uh, in which the US or the European Union alone can solve the solution. But there might be other files on which we could sit down and see that maybe we have a division of labor and maybe the Europeans do a bit more on one file and the Americans do a little bit more on another file, keeping coordinated, but maybe delegating a bit more or getting a bit more space. In the previous era, we were used to do everything together. And I think that this, this last four years have, uh, have, have made us understand that we do have a space for our own initiatives. Uh, you, uh, you learn, um, in Italian we have a say, and I'm not sure it exists in, in English, uh, that you make of an assess virtue out of necessity. Uh, if you're forced to face uh, a difficulty, you try to turn it into an opportunity. If there, is an if there has been an opportunity in these last years is that we, are, we Europeans have realized that there are some issues on which we can disagree with Washington. And this is not the best possible option, but it's possible. And we have a role to play in any case as Europeans. And sometimes take the Iran deal, a life-saving role for some international agreements. We prefer to go together with Washington, but if not, we can go alone. Um, again, I would expect that with the Biden administration that would not happen again, not going alone. Uh, but there might be uh, files on which we, uh, we might as Europeans or our American friends on the other side, um, keep some more, uh, some more space uh, and prioritizing the common action on the files that uh, absolutely require us to work hand in hand together because otherwise they don't move forward on a global level. Thank you very much for that um, assessment. And uh, we, we wait to see uh, who we will be uh, dealing with uh, in the European transatlantic sphere. Uh, I have a question here, which uh, brings our discussion to China. And uh, <clears throat> it's from Karen, <coughs> excuse me, Karen Ferris of Fairview. Uh, and she says, there is a growing international concern regarding China's approach to quelling internal dissent and dealing with minority groups. And in your view, uh, is the EU willing to have an honest uh, conversation with China? And how might the EU act as a positive influencer to encourage other countries to take a more critical approach in their engagement with China? This is, uh, thank you for the question. I think this is a critical question. Uh, it's, uh, the European Union is already having a very candid conversation with the Chinese authorities, not only the authorities, also with the civil society in China. Um, I think this is still the practice. Um, it was in any case during my five years, the European Union has human rights dialogues uh, with China, uh, which are very candid. And uh, for what concerns me personally, my personal experience every time I visited China, that happened quite often. Uh, I also had always meetings with civil society representatives, uh, obviously very discreetly and uh, um, yeah, pay attention first and foremost to their security, but uh, 
Um, that always happened. And our conversations and the European Union conversations with the Chinese authorities have always been very candid on this, um, which is something that uh, the Chinese authorities have, uh, I think, uh, well, not always liked, that's clear, uh, but somehow uh, appreciated in this respect, uh, that um, when you, when you interact with the European Union, uh, you might have elements that you don't like, for instance, the accents put on human rights uh, and civil society empowerment, um, but you know what you get. Uh, there's no surprise. The European Union values and, uh, and viewpoints and policies are transparent, are solid. Let me add, uh, sometimes need a little bit more of consistency inside the European Union. This helps also projecting them outside of the European Union. The more we are strict on our own standards on human rights, the better we manage to promote them outside. But this is another story. Uh, but uh, the, the conversation is candid and sometimes it's constructive. Um, I have to say that uh, um, I think the Chinese authorities recognize the, um, the consistency and uh, the transparency and the correct approach of the European Union uh, to these issues, uh, which is never instrumental to other, other elements. It's always purely and genuinely focused on human rights issues. Uh, it's never a transactional approach, um, such as saying, uh, which other actors sometimes play, uh, saying, uh, you know, for us, human rights uh, um, discussions are aimed at creating an environment where inside a bigger negotiations, then we can get something else out of you and then we'll forget about human rights. No, the Europeans stick to human rights issues even when uh, it's only about human rights. I have to say the problem here is that uh, First, sometimes we are a bit left alone. There's not many others uh, in the world that are so firm and, uh, uh, and stubborn, I would say, on support of civil society and human rights issues, minority issues, not only with China, uh, with, with all our interlocutors. Huh? Um, I, we were talking about the United States. Um, I will always remember there was one particular day when the, at the time, um, uh, Secretary of State of the United States um, had a, a public uh, um, uh, statement uh, saying that uh, human rights were not the guiding principle of US foreign policy anymore. In that particular moment, there were two players in the world, three players in the world that felt very lonely, the European Union, the United Nations and Canada. Uh, but then we connected among ourselves and we tried to keep up uh, the good causes. Um, that is to say, uh, we are not, uh, we are, there's not many other international players that uh, put human rights uh, on top of their foreign policy agenda. We are, I think, still uh, among them and probably the best champions of, uh, of, uh, of human rights uh, um, uh, in, in the world. Uh, and here, to me, the key is this, uh, to, um, to be open and transparent uh, with China, for instance, we have not only different standards on human rights, we have different political systems. Uh, we are a democracy based uh, continent uh, and differences can be spelled out very frankly. We are competitors, so we are even, even we defined even rivals uh, in one of the last uh, policy um, policies that we issued uh, on, on relations with China. And we can have a frank and open and constructive, hopefully, uh, conversation uh, with the Chinese authorities, provided, and I will finish with that on this question, provided that we are also open to discuss our own foreign policy, um, human rights issues, uh, because the European Union also is not perfect. I mean, we are, as I said, we are probably the best place to be in terms of human rights in the world, human rights, social rights, uh, gender rights, for sure, there's no better place than Europe. Uh, but we are far, far from from being a perfect place when it comes to human rights, respect and promotion. And we have a long way to go. And I think we need to be open to criticism also when it comes to our own human rights policies. I think for instance, of uh, some elements of how we treated the migration crisis, the so-called migration crisis uh, during uh, 2015, 2016, where some criticism from our interlocutors were, I think, grounded, uh, or some criticism we might face on some shortcomings we can have on rule of law and, uh, uh, and respect of diversity in our societies. 
or minorities. So we need to be open to criticism and this gives us the credibility to discuss other, um, other countries' shortcomings as well, I think. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for that reminder that we do need indeed uh, sometimes to turn the mirror back on ourselves and to assess how we are doing before we go forth with other countries. I am going to exercise uh, for my prerogative as chairman to ask you about an area that you know very well about Iran. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, what is your view of um, the Iranian, uh, can you assess the Iranian role in the region as it is now? And also, what is your view of the future of the um, JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, and where that that is likely to go? Well, um, I'll start from the second part of the question, because I guess, well, imagine, I, I, I find it easier than the previous one. Uh, I think that uh, we managed so far uh, to save somehow, far from ideal, but save somehow the deal. Uh, it is not completely that. And uh, uh, I have to say, I would say nobody would have expected that a few years ago. This was because uh, the European Union, first and foremost, member states um, uh, kept a strong position on that. Uh, the UK included, let me say so, always, uh, at all stages, um, perfect unity there. Uh, the rest of the international community, uh, Russia, China, uh, all the rest of the international community from Africa to Asia to Latin America to the UN system, all behind that agreement. I would say that only a couple of, mem a couple of UN member states uh, were actually uh, not behind the agreement's uh, full implementation but we managed to preserve and keep the unity. And I have also to say, the Iranian leadership has shown on that particular file, well, they could have, they could have for sure uh, implemented on their side more, but after the, after the decision to, to, of the Trump administration to leave the agreement, but uh, they, um, they kept implementing the agreement for a long time uh, in difficult circumstances. So I would say that they had shown at that time um, resilience and determination on uh, staying on the right track. And they, I think they need to be, um, this need to be recognized. So I think that if, I've always been convinced of that, if the, uh, if the deal was not um, killed in the moment when the Trump administration decided to leave it, um, then it is still possible uh, with another administration coming in uh, hopefully, it's no mystery, uh, that I would uh, hope for one result rather than another. Um, I would expect that uh, um, one of the first moves uh, would be to restore uh, the um, full uh, compliance to the JCPOA. Look at ways to do that, because it's complicated uh, to, um, to go back to, um, to, to the full compliance uh, to, to the JCPOA. But I would, uh, I would expect and I would advise a new US administration to put that among the first priorities uh, in foreign policy and security policy. Let me stress security policy because this is not a, a foreign policy deal. This is a non-proliferation deal. This is a nuclear uh, non-proliferation deal. So for us Europeans are always being clear, this is a security related uh, need and priority uh, because we are so far that uh, having a nuclear Iran would be too dangerous for us and for the region. The Middle East just misses a nuclear arm race, and then, uh, and then um, we don't miss anything else. Um, the Iranian role in the region has been somehow linked to that. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal was uh, never intended to be a regional uh, cooperative deal. Uh, intentionally, from the beginning, um, regional dynamics were left uh, outside of the negotiating table. Right or wrong, this was a decision taken uh, back in the beginning of the uh, of the negotiations, uh, uh, 2003, a uh, long time ago. This was the mandate we had to negotiate only nuclear things, not regional dynamics. But uh, no mystery, uh, in the moment when the nuclear deal was uh, achieved uh, and then implemented and then signed and ratified everything, uh, when it entered into force, it was clear that this would have 
constituted uh, a building block of a different kind of regional dynamic, a more cooperative regional dynamic. In Europe, we know very well, in Ireland as well, you can, you can be former enemies, you can still not be friends, but you can learn to live next to each other in peace and in some forms of cooperation. You can turn from being enemies to being in Europe, even part of the same political union. But far from that, you don't need to become friends. You can keep your differences and divergences and even conflicts, but you can learn to deconflict and live together in a sustainable manner because you don't change geography. That's a given. There are a few things you can't change in life. You can't change geography, you can't change history, and you can't choose your parents. Apart from that, probably everything is possible to be changed, but you can't change geography. And Iran is there, it's not going to disappear. So the, 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 the nuclear deal was also intended to be the beginning of a different kind of process where the regional powers could come together, possibly together with the European Union, with the United States, with others at the international scene, and find a way to build a sustainable framework for regional cooperation, non-conflictual living together on the model of uh, the Helsinki process in Europe, on the model of even of the reconciliation we faced in Europe after the Second World War. Uh, and I am convinced personally that this would have been possible. Uh, I'm still convinced that this would be possible. Uh, I'm still convinced that there is enough political will for doing that in the region. I am because, because the region has everything to lose from a conflict and it's a rich interconnected region. Uh, you look at the economy, uh, you look at the connections, even look at the flights, and you understand that the links are there. So using the economic potential of a living together uh, would be, I think, an incredible incentive. But you need, you need an international environment to go there, and you need the Iran nuclear deal to be fully in place for the going there, and we're not there. So conditions, I think, are still there. But obviously, that would require a different kind of um, approach uh, from, um, from uh, let's say, from the global scene. But I I, I'm convinced that Europe could play still a role there, because it's a privileged partner for the Gulf countries and uh, for the Arab League, uh, very strong partner. Uh, and uh, it's a trusted interlocutor. I wouldn't say partner, but it's a trusted interlocutor for Iran. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, regrettably, I think we only have room for one last question. And uh, in doing, uh, putting the question, I will pass on greetings to you from uh, an old friend from Brussels days, who is the British ambassador to Ireland, Paul Johnson. Uh, and he has a question which I have uh, also um, a couple of questions of similar uh, uh, similar nature, which is, how do you see the internal EU debate about strategic autonomy? Uh, another uh, of our questioners um, says that um, uh, Paul Honer from UCD says that it seems to have different interpretations across different agencies. Strategic autonomy. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, great to, to hear the question, Paul, and uh, greetings back. Uh, strategic autonomy, uh, I, I always refer to it as a cooperative autonomy. Uh, but this is, this is my trademark. <laughs> this has been uh, the way in which I presented it. Uh, I think that the, the European way, um, you can call it strategic autonomy, the European way uh, is this, um, to go uh, alone if needed, but to go together wherever possible, together with others. Uh, to look for cooperation on a structural basis systematically within uh, the transatlantic framework, with NATO when it comes to security, uh, with the UN system. Uh, the European DNA is looking for partnerships and going together with others. So strategic autonomy has nothing to do with isolation or the temptation of going alone. But if you look at the etymology of autonomy, 
uh, and you look at the roots of the word, it means, uh, and Paul has, has listened to me <laughs> saying this uh, many times uh, in formal meetings, autonomy means the capacity to define your own rules by yourself has a lot to do with sovereignty, is a lot to do with the capacity to determine your own, uh, yes, your own norms by yourself, to not to be subject to an external decision-making body on your own decisions. I think it is only natural for the European Union uh, to have a certain level of strategic autonomy. Uh, and that I am 100% sure, it's not, it would be contradictory to our history otherwise. I'm convinced this would not bring the European Union to uh, being either conflictual or isolated uh, towards others. I'm, I think that actually being strategically autonomous would help us building partnerships with others because you you fear partnerships when you don't feel safe enough secure enough in your own autonomy and then entering into a partnership with another might uh, put in danger your own uh, uh, your own uh, um, capacity to decide for yourself at the end of the day it's this but i'm pretty sure i don't see it otherwise the european union strategic autonomy will always be a cooperative one uh, no way it can be different, and in particular, uh, a very strong transatlantic bond, and I know this is not the case for Ireland uh, as a member state of the European Union, but a very strong tie with NATO when it comes to, um, to security cooperation, We're talking about the European Union. Thank you, and uh, regretfully we have come to the end of our discussion. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt that we could go on for another hour, but it has been a wonderfully rich discussion. And I want to thank you so much, Rector, for sharing your uh, experience of your time as uh, my representative and also uh, looking forward to the future and uh, laying down some paths for us, uh, for the European Union, uh, as, as we go forward in this strange time, which hopefully we will not last and that we can have you uh, sometime in the future um, in uh, actually present in Dublin again. But it has been a wonderful um, discussion to start off uh, and the inauguration of the Global Europe Programme. And we thank you most sincerely again and wish you um, uh, the very best in your new role as Rector of the um, uh, College of Europe, which has given us so many uh, of our diplomats and our diplomats around Europe. So thank you most sincerely for that again. And, uh, Thank you very much and looking forward uh, to being uh, present uh, in person in Dublin or to welcome you all in uh, Bruges uh, in the moment when uh, uh, this uh, will be possible again. And thank you again for the opportunity and looking forward for further cooperation.